Um, and I think we'll probably have a few more people joining in, but why don't we get started? Uh, good morning, everybody, and happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Uh, thanks for tuning in today's uh, Joint Economic Development Committee meeting uh, hosted by the Hawaii Island Chamber and Japanese Chamber of Commerce and Industry of Hawaii. Uh, both Randy and Toby had last minute conflicts come up in their schedule, so uh, weren't, uh, aren't able to join us today and they, they send their apologies. Um, before we bring in our, our speakers, um, let's uh, go around the room if we could and everyone introduce yourselves and maybe which uh, business or organiza organization you represent. Um, we have a couple new faces here, so yeah, good chance to get to know people. Okay, so um, I'll start with Keola and then followed by Lincoln. Okay, aloha everyone. Uh, I'm happy to be here this morning. Uh, I'm Keola and I, I'm here on behalf of Kamehameha Schools, uh, Kula Ke'eki, the high school here uh, in Keaau. And um, yeah, just looking forward to, to joining you all this morning. Thank you and happy holidays. Good morning, everyone. Hope everyone is uh, doing well. My name is Lincoln Ashida. Um, I'm a partner at the Torkelson Katz Law Firm. Um, I'm also presently the president of the Japanese Chamber of Commerce Industry of Hawaii, also a longtime member of the Hawaii Island uh, Chamber of Commerce. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Uh, let's go to Justin and Glenn. Hi, my name is Justin Clayton. Um, I'm a, a fairly new member here uh, with the uh, Chamber of Commerce, but um, I'm a business banker here with Central Pacific Bank based out of their Hilo branch. Glenn? Well, hello, everybody. I'm Glenn Kogamita, retired and just interested in um, helping our island improve and reaching and exceeding its potential. Aloha. Thank you. Okay, next let's go to Marsha followed by Alan. Hi everyone, Marsha Sakai, retired from University of Hawaii at Hilo. Um, I've been a long time member of the Hawaii Island Chamber and continue to be interested, especially in the economic development portion of what the chamber look, takes a look at, as well as how education can fit into that. Hi, I'm Alan Okinaka. I'm uh, retired also, often referred to as being retarded. Um, I, um, I have an uh, eternal curiosity for everything that's important. And so I get involved with all kinds of stuff. Thank you guys. Uh, next, let's go to Julie, followed by Doug, and then Steve. Aloha everyone and happy holidays. Um, Julie Maurer, I oversee the Center for Community Engagement at UH Hilo. Doug Adams, County of Hawaii and the bane of Ross Birch's existence. Hi, uh, I'm Steve Uera, president of Suisan Company. Thank you, everybody, and again, welcome. Um, joining us today for a visitor industry update, we have Ross Birch, which I think everyone here knows, uh, executive director for the Island of, Island of Hawaii Visitors Bureau. And also joining us, we have recently appointed Island of Hawaii Destination Manager, Rachel Kaima. Uh, thank you both for being here. Ross will be providing an update on uh, year-to-date visitor stats uh, compared to pre-pandemic -pre and what we want to see moving forward, uh, really taking into consideration the new Omicron variant and its economic impact. Um, let's see how Ross's uh, crystal ball is on this. Um, he will introduce you all to Rachel and we'll talk about the new shift to destination management 
and um, his organization's contract to manage the funding. Okay, Ross, all yours. Take it away. Oh, Miles, appreciate it. Glad, to, great to see everybody. Glad I could make it, and yes, I am coming in remotely from another island. Uh, on my way to uh, support our JTB uh, organization. First time we've been actually be getting together uh, and to support our uh, Japanese wholesalers. So doing a little work at the same time. Uh, definitely always great to see familiar faces. Those that have been on uh, through the chambers through all these years. Uh, appreciate Lincoln's um, leadership for the Japanese chamber. Uh, Miles, definitely for everything done uh, to support all the, the tourism efforts as well. Like Miles mentioned, we're, I'm going to do a little bit of a quick update of what we've been doing um, through the pandemic, a little bit of statistics as far as how the island had been doing and, and where it's uh, headed and then getting into more of what are we really going to be working on um, and including uh, Rachel in the process of the destination management action plan and the community enrichment program. So since I am in transit and may not have the greatest connection, I'm going to have Rachel share her screen with our presentation. Okay, I'll get that going. There are also some videos that are included in this presentation. What I'll do is I'll share it um, with Miles so that he can distribute it and then the links to the videos so that you guys can watch them at your leisure in their full length. It's uh, probably better off that way anyway. Okay, here we go, Miles. Okay. okay. So yes, the. Yeah, I'll go to the next slide, that's fine. So the COVID support that we've been doing from the very beginning uh, is we've been manning the phone calls on the 1-800-GO-HAWAII, the email phone, their emails that have been coming in regularly uh, early on with the questions about uh, access to Hawaii, how to get here. Uh, and then eventually we switched to the Safe Travels program, uh, airport support and backup for Roberts. Uh, we did assisted with the testing upon arrival and what the process would be for that. Uh, kept up to date with the property uh, updates and their protocols. And then right now we're really more focused on the continued support for the, uh, the visitor entry. Um, as things change constantly, the governor um, giving the um, ability for the mayors to make their decisions and then Communicating that to our upcoming visitors is more of the process. And then also working with uh, the county and, and diff different agencies should visitors become COVID positive during their, their stay while on island. So, yes, now direct flights. The great news is, is that we are have resumed uh, the flight levels that we had even uh, compared to 2019. Uh, on a daily basis, uh, Hilo is getting um, their United flight five times a week, um, increased lift between Hawaiian and, and Southwest between Honolulu for accessibility there. And then the Kona side, uh, Kona Airport seeing uh, direct access uh, up to between 20, 23 flights a day uh, coming in there from all different locations throughout the country, uh, obviously LA and uh, the West Coast are the primary locations that they're coming in from. Next slide. So this kind of shows you where we are. Oh. Yep, sorry. This shows you where we are as far as that uh, total seats that are in inventory uh, compared to 2020. It's not, I, I do, don't even consider 2020 a statistical year. Uh, it, it doesn't compare to anything else, nor does it give us any uh, correlation to historical data at all. So everything that we do is going to incorporate 2019 uh, as the that would have uh, good statistics where you can see for Kona, we're actually almost 4% above seats coming into Kona as we were in 2019 year to date. 
uh, Hilo is lagging a little bit because they were at seven days a week with United and had only recovered to five days a week so far. So I'm hoping that once we get into 2022, uh, they'll resume uh, greater service there as well. Next slide. So these are the statistics that come straight from the Hawaii Tourism Authority or the DBET uh, website. Uh, some of the key factors that you see here, uh, again, taking the 21 versus 20, uh, I rarely look at that sheet at all. Uh, I take the 20 versus nine, or 21 versus 19. If you look at that sheet on the right-hand side there, um, the two categories that really have changed um, for 2021 is the length of stay and then the per person per trip spending. Uh, we've actually seen those grow uh, immensely. People are definitely spending a lot more time while they're on island here and that equates to a greater spend per trip. Uh, the per person per day is still lagging slightly, but uh, I feel that 2022, we're gonna get that back in line as well. Uh, the key factors here is we're looking at and then the average daily census is a new statistic that we've been tracking, which is actually more of an impact on the island. It shows us exactly how many people are on island at any given point on any given day. Uh, our, our goal as we work forward is to have less visitors staying longer, spending more money. So that uh, we're heading in that direction. We just need to start getting uh, the higher spending as we get through that process. Next slide. This is a, a PACE report basically on what the upcoming bookings are. Uh, this is 2021 versus uh, 2020 bookings. So you can see that we've paced far ahead uh, for November and December of this year into the first quarter. Uh, we're looking at, at numbers that are still ahead of pace because we weren't quite available at that time. And then the June, July, and August numbers aren't quite as high as you would think, uh, but they are above what they were for the previous year, or which were very strong. June, July, and August were strong months in 2020 uh, prior to the August 23rd uh, notification from the governor to stay home. And then you can see how that changes a little bit for bookings in September, October, beyond. Next slide. This is a, a kind of a, a chart that'll show you what the uh, total inventory we have available in rooms versus uh, where the pace was two years ago for bookings, where on the books bookings for this year and for last year, you can see the red. Uh, we were definitely very low for a period of time and then started to regain some of that. So uh, the pace looks pretty good as we start getting into 2022. Next slide. I think this is the... Oh, it goes right to the video. So uh, this was the video we played uh, or the video we produced uh, on, in October uh, upon the reopening uh, for the very first time welcoming visitors to come back to the island, uh, but do it appropriately and to keep in mind uh, all the cultural uh, aspects that we have while we did it, as well as you know the COVID restrictions. So that was the first video we had there. I'll give you guys all the links to these. Uh, within the recent year as well, we've had a big push on the Pona Pledge as well. So we revamped the video for Pona Pledge uh, translated it to the full Hawaiian language. Uh, and this was locally produced right in, in Hilo and came out amazingly well. The traction is, is phenomenal on this and the traction is all based off of organic. We put no marketing money behind this and we wanted our local residents to spread the word. They were behind it, they created it, and they were the ones actually doing the marketing for us organically, uh, which created a whole lot more traction than it did previously being branded as county or IHVB. So I think we, we found a, a little secret uh, that I'm not going to tell any of our other islands uh, how to get it done and to get things accomplished organically. So that was the Pona Pledge video. And then I think we have one more. 
Yes. <laughs> now our new campaign is Malama Hawaii. So as we move forward, Malama Hawaii is, is the, the new campaign we have um, really connecting the visitor with our volunteer opportunities. So um, that website is created. Uh, videos are being produced for every one of the islands, as well as greater connections with those entities that provide these experiences. Also part of the Destination Management Action Plan. Next slide. These are just some of the examples uh, and connections that you can see from the website. I suggest everybody go check it out. Uh, GoHawaii.com slash Malama uh, is a great way to dig into it. And if you are associated with any of these um, organizations or know of one that's not listed, we would definitely love to hear uh, what that opportunity may be. Next slide. So this is one of the Malama Hawaii videos. Um, I don't think the, the sound is coming up for any of them. So I think we'll skip past this. Um, there is a question, Roth. Are these videos shown on the flights coming in? The Pono Pledge will start to be on Hawaiian Airlines, I believe at the end of January. The rest of them, I think they do have pieces of these um, or at least, at least vignettes within Hawaiian Airlines, as well as I think Alaska and United are starting to put them into their um, repertoire of entertainment on the flight. So. You have to hear the music and the background. It's just amazing. Um, yeah, we can. Yeah, we'll skip through the video. And yeah. When you have time, go to that website. I'm sorry that's not working for us today. There we go. So I did a little graphic here. Uh, I think everybody had been tracking HB 862 uh, and the effects of it. Um, the, uh, it really affected HD and HBCB's organizations and, and how they function and are funded. Uh, so next slide. This one? Yes. Okay, so, great. Did anyone see that bus uh, that just ran us over? Uh, the elimination of the TAT tax or the, the TAT allocation for the 21 22 fiscal year and beyond. Funding for all 2022 marketing uh, contractors will come from ARPA funds uh, moving forward into the next fiscal year. Uh, so, what happened? Uh, when the TAT tax or when HB 862 went to effect, uh, there was still TAT funding that was allocated to HTA and, and distributed for the 2021 fiscal year. Now, those funds that weren't utilized uh, were basically put into the Destination Management Action Plan the SEP program and other contracts like the overhead expenses for the island chapters, as well as the international markets. Um, that equaled about $9.4 million that HTA had funding that had been provided that needed to be contracted and allocated by June 30, uh, 2021. Otherwise, the, that those monies would go back to the legislature. So these programs that we're talking about as far as moving forward would not be in place if HTA didn't take those uh, existing funds and contract them to move forward into the 21-22 fiscal year and the calendar year of 2022. Uh, essentially, which then created uh, HVCB's contract to do the Community Enrichment Program and the Destination Management Action Plan. Uh, when the DMAP was created and discussions were made, steering committees were, were created, the real intent was basically to have the County of Hawaii be the funding and the fiscal source of that process. 
because HTA needed to get those funds contracted within a very short deadline, uh, HVCB and the Island Chapter stepped in and were able to get the contract completed to make sure that those funds were established and set to go, that they could have them used in the upcoming year. Uh, as far as the Kukuola and the Aloha Aina programs, uh, the Kauai, uh, Kauai Community Foundation are, were the ones that were contracted to do that in a very similar fashion, short, very short notice and a quick turnaround from that standpoint. Currently under the process right now is there's an RFP for the U.S. market and the meetings in the MCI market as well that's underway. And those markets will be funded through ARPA that have much greater restrictions uh, at a federal level uh, than previous funding has been done through the TAT taxes. So next slide. So that being said, the Destination Management Action Plan uh, was created by the steering committee. The steering committee was a, a group of community individuals from cultural practitioners to those that are in the hospitality industry to government officials to uh, a lot of different um, facets coming together to really look at what items needed to be addressed uh, on our island that are relating to the visitor industry and the impacts from that. Uh, that process, we came up with 10 main action items with 45 sub actions. Uh, there's three phases altogether over 22 months and the total funding we have available to do is $747,000 per program on that side. So far, 86% of phase one projects are underway in some way, shape or form either through Kuku, Ola, Aloha, Aina, SEP, or other programs already as they exist. Or they're being addressed by other entities like the county, DLNR, or other state agencies. Uh, and we're tracking those progressions as well. Next slide. And then the community enrichment program. Uh, that's, I think everybody's familiar with that from a county standpoint over the years. Uh, the SEP program is basically festivals and events uh, that took a hiatus for the last couple of years because we weren't able to have any festivals and events um, coming back in. Uh, we now have a budget of $525,000 for our island specifically for programs. Uh, we are going through the RFP uh, review process right now, and the announcement on the selection should come out early next week. Next slide. Perfect. Sorry, I kind of ran through that fast, but I wanted to make sure we got the information there. There was a question about what does it mean that a video is produced organically? Okay, so organic, well, it's not produced organically. The video was produced as normal production would go. The distribution of that video is organic because there's no marketing funding or process behind it. It is basically someone taking that video, sharing it with another individual who shares it with another individual who keeps the process going without any paid advertisement of that video being on social media or any other platform. Does that answer the question? Is that good, Alan? I'm not really sure if it answers the question. It seems, um, it just seems like another way to describe something not relevant. <laughs> I'm well, sorry. It, it, it happened, I should say it happened on its own. There was no other outside influence other than individuals passing it along themselves. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. And the other question I had was, uh, what is this ARPA? I'm familiar with the Advanced Research Project Agency at the federal level, but is this another organization? No, it's the federal, it's, it's federal funding that was allocated to the state that they're using for uh, tourism marketing. And this comes out of that ARPA? It does, and it's for one year only. Because they usually, um, they usually fund programs and projects that are more defense related. 
Exactly. So it's that's where the HB 862 had taken it and the legislature had approved ARPA funds for the very first year uh, for funding of HTA and their programs. And then after this year, HTA needs to go to the legislature with a program in hand and then ask for funding directly from the general fund. Hey Ross, if I could pop in briefly. Uh, so ARPA in this case is the American Rescue Plan funding. This is the um, Biden administration's um, funding that was the follow on to CARES um, that came out of the Trump administration. Uh, so there's a whole host of different types of funds. You had the state and local fiscal recovery funds um, that provided the 6.2 billion to the state of Hawaii. The funding that um, Ross was talking about for HTA um, came out of that funding. Uh, and then 862 actually then made HTA um, go to uh, the legislature on an annual basis. That's the piece that he's talking about. But, the, uh, but ARPA in this case is the American Rescue Plan Act and it's the uh, funding associated with COVID recovery. Thanks, Doug. Great explanation. So there's nothing to do with the Advanced Research Project Agency? No. Okay. And that's why they're temporary. That's why it's only a one year process because they are from the. I, I kind of took the, the lead on the presentation. Rachel's only been with us for a little over three weeks now. Um, it is a little overwhelming. As, as she's going through this process. So I want to kind of take it easy. Uh, and then she's also working remotely out of our little office and from home until she can relocate to the island. So I want you guys to take it easy on her as well until she <laughs> Thank yeah. you, Ross, you're so sweet. <laughs> Hi, um, Ross, this is Marsha. Uh, I wanted to ask a follow-up question uh, to the funding process that, that you described. I stepped away, so I may not have heard the whole thing, but will a state level H HTA be making the request or will the request be coming from the individual island um, bureaus? Well, in, in this situation, what happens is there's an RFP process that would go out that RFP process um, will then set up the request as you move forward. So um, the each individual market will then have to do a proposal that goes to HTA that HTA will compile and then put their proposal to the legislature. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, I was just wondering how how because you know I've uh, I've had some experience representing um, the UH Hilo campus um, in the the uh, proposals for the University of Hawaii, and it seems like um, it'll be different because we're allowed to put in a, a request that's compiled into a total request, but it it's uh, clearly shows what UH Hilo had asked for. Yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's all brand new. Basically, uh, this is, we're, we're going back to the days prior to HTA. Essentially, as we're going back to where HVCB would put together a proposal of a marketing program, take it to the legislature, ask for money, and whatever they gave or whatever portion of it they gave is, would have to, that's how they dealt with it and put a marketing program. So now HTA is the essential one that's going to be walking to the legislature with a program based from each one of the contracted agencies for each one of the markets. So you're gonna have a, a US, a MCI, Japan, Korea, Oceania, and Canada will all be part of the process for the ask. Plus HTA will then have to put in Destination Management Action Plan, the SEP, Kukuola, Olaina, all the other programs that they do as well outside of marketing 
will have to be outlined and budgeted upon the request as well. Also, so it could either be one law, be different ones, uh, depending on the situation. So the destination marketing plan execution is also anticipated to be funded through this request to the legislature? Yes, absolutely. The ones, the one beyond this contract that goes through May of 2023. Mm -hmm. So should they continue the program beyond May 2023, uh, along with SEP and all the other um, regular programs as well, they're going to have to add that uh, into their request. Well, at some time, maybe, you know, as, as this uh, process gets a little more mature, um, I'd be interested in hearing you come back to describe to us how all this, um, how these efforts will be integrated. I'm expecting that you may have read something um, that the University of Hawaii Economic Research Organization put out about how what Hawaii really needs for its tourism is better governance among independent agencies because tourism touches so much. And that's, I think, been made clear by you know, the, the participants that have come to your um, uh, destination management um, meetings. Um, that we need, we need people to partner well and collaborate well. Um, so, so that's that's the part that I think I'd be interested in seeing how we can begin to execute better. I, I think that this the DMAP program is 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 in line with that process. Um, I I have to watch. Uh, a little bit of what I say um, in, in this conversation, uh, being an existing contractor and, and through this process, but, you know, it's, I think that HTA it was far ahead of the game when it came to destination management and trying to put programs in place that would help manage this, but were never really given uh, full authority in a lot of these situations where the jurisdiction really fell into other agencies, um, state specific, maybe a few county potentially. And, and examples of that on a county level, and Doug knows this all too well, is, you know, vacation rentals are an issue on all of the islands. And that's more of a county level than it is a state level. Most of the parks are state DLNR. So there's, there's a lot of things that I feel have not been up to speed to where HTA has kind of stepped in and tried to do what it could from not just a marketing standpoint, but look at programs to help on the management side, but really not provided full access and control of that as well. I hope that was my politically correct statement. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let me uh, be less politically correct. Um, HTA is trying to take on more than they actually have authority to do. Um, a lot of the work that needs to be done is really DLNR, but for some reason that hasn't necessarily occurred and HTA is recognizing that there is work that needs to be done. And so they're stepping into the void, but not really with statutory authority. So they're doing it by power of influence to some degree. Thank you, Doug. That is well articulated on what I was trying to get to <laughs> uh, and more coming better coming from you than it is for me in that situation. I, I don't want to pat our own back or, you know, point out some of the things that we've done, but it's great to see that some other people from the outside can see uh, what the true effect is. Um, Ross, I was wondering if you could touch on, um, I think you mentioned, uh, you know, vacation rentals. I was wondering, or I guess I'm assuming that your booking, bookings projections included vacation rentals. Um, it does not. Oh, okay. Um, so, you know, at, at least what I was seeing at a national trend is, you know, during COVID, there was a big, a big shift from um, hotel bookings to vacation rentals. And, you know, people 
staying at the vacation rentals, cooking and things. And, um, you know, I was wondering if, if, you know, post pandemic, are we seeing a trend back to, um, hotel bookings and are, are people staying in resort areas and, and spending in resort areas? We're, we're actually seeing, uh, more of the trend back to the hotel. Hotel occupancies are a little bit higher than they were pre-pandemic. Um, the inventory that we have based off the statistics from DBET and HTA show that our island's vacation rental inventory is almost 40% down from pre-pandemic as well, which is not a bad thing. It's, it's actually allowing those that are still in the market to have higher occupancies themselves provide a little bit better product. And I think those that were washed out of uh, the process were, were more or less houses that were probably sold um, during the pandemic as well. Those that were in a vacation rental market that the owners ended up actually just uh, selling the property, not knowing exactly when they could get back online. Okay. Yeah, no, that, that helps. Yeah, thanks. There is a trend with, with the individual vacation stays, but it's, it, it's an interesting mix for Hawaii. Uh, I think some of the other locations around the country set up far better uh, for a vacation rental situation than Hawaii does specifically. Uh, you know, we're, I'm talking areas of, of like larger cities or like the Phoenix area or places that um, have a infrastructure set up um, really that covers more for their own local residents. Uh, the impact that they would get from um, visitation isn't uh, too much of an impact. Okay, thank you. Doug, there's a question. How are we assessing the Malama Hawaii or the Pono Hawaii pledge or Malama Hawaii pledge efforts? The success or... That's, that's a great question. Malam Hawaii is really uh, kind of a, a newer program that's been starting. We are tracking participation in many of the projects or opportunities that are there. Uh, from that standpoint, we're also tracking the number of opportunities uh, that we have, trying to create new ones in this process of connecting the visitors to uh, volunteer or you know, project-based um, operations on the island. Uh, so we're kind of in the beginning stages, but there are KPIs on that. Uh, Pono Pledge, we basically just take a more or less who's been signing up for the pledge is our number one KPI, which amazingly, and again, to Alan's point, organically, um, we saw a almost more than double participation in a four-month period than we saw in four years of having Pono Pledge available. So... It's almost to the point where if we say it's not from us, it didn't come from IHVB or the County of Hawaii, people are like, this is a cool thing. And they've been sharing it and they've been taking ownership of it, really. And that's exactly what we wanted to have happen. So I don't think we have really KPIs for that, but we're seeing the trending uh, and, and how it's being distributed is the biggest difference uh, that we've seen. Does that answer the question, Julie? That's actually really great to hear because, you know, just thinking about our community and kind of that tension that exists between tourism and local residents and how we can, you know, better bring those things together. Um, and I think these types of campaigns are great ways to do that. It was a, an amazing tool that it's really doing that in itself. A lot of the local residents are now taking more ownership uh, in the communication with visitors. Um, if they come across a visitor on the street, they can, they're really more engaging in that process as well. And this, this tool assists them in a way to make that connection. So if we can continue down that line, come up with different type of um, projects or opportunities with Pono Pledge um, or even volunteer opportunities taking Pono Pledge to the next level. Absolutely, that's the direction we're gonna go. It's all led by the county. 
it's it truly is led by the county. We support it. We have done a lot of the behind the scenes work for it. But I think now in its existence in the community, it belongs to the community and they need to keep running with it. Um, Ross, I got a question on the volunteer opportunities. Um, are those being organized by nonprofits or can for profits, you know, wanting to provide uh, volunteer opportunities? Is it would, it would it be open to them too? That's a good question. I, I know that really nonprofits is the focus. Uh, I think we even even looking at this, I, I, I do feel that a for-profit organization um, similar to actually like uh, a Kala Farmer in, in YPO Valley, it's a for-profit or operation, but have opportunities to engage with visitors and help them assist in the processing of cultivating um, Kala and the Poi and, and through that. So, I don't know if Malama Hawaii, I, I need to research that a little bit more to find out if there is a restriction on that side or if HTA has a restriction, much like SEP and other programs where it needs to be a nonprofit in order to receive funding for. But as far as participation, that might be different. Great question though. Ross, at, at this moment, what are the top three issues as far as looking at destination management from political, cultural, uh, economic uh, point of view? Right. I think from the destination management action plan, I think the, the, the top issues are one, the hot spots. Um, that it's, it's the over inundated areas. It's the over... Um, Optimized uh, areas. Uh, we're looking at, you know, um, Polulu Valley. We've already got a program in place where they've got um, greeters uh, uh, through a DLNR and Kupu uh, program through HTA. Uh, we're in conversations right now with YPO Valley uh, and and Heather Kimball to to put together a steering committee and have uh, moderated um, community sessions to talk about accessibility to YPO Valley. Uh, we're looking at Papakolea, the Green Sand Beach, uh, a few of these areas, uh, Ho'okena and um, Kealakiko Bay. All of these areas have kind of spoken out about their issues. And I think that's gonna be kind of the forefront of how do we manage access to a lot of these locations, which will solve a lot of the other issues we would potentially have in line with it. Um, obviously, uh, vacation rentals and wh what we can do to play our part in uh, understanding uh, how many we have, where they're at, what they do, what their capabilities are, how do we incorporate them into the inventory. I mean, it, it, those, that's another one of the, the topics. And then really just engaging the, the um, community and cultural sites and how do we connect the community opportunities with our visitation are really our priorities. Yeah, Ross, um, just to share, I have a friend who has a, a VRBO and um, on, from her side, she was encouraging her, her clients to participate in volunteer activities, which, you know, and, and by doing so, she was able to elevate the uh, favorable responses she got, the, 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 um, the comments and, and stuff. So she was just telling me yesterday, it's like, she's so excited that she's able to incorporate all the, the cultural, the, the natural resource things into what she's offering her guests. So I, I, I think the, the greatest thing we can do is create those connections. Yeah. Provide the information, provide the opportunities so that someone like that can get on board with it and utilize the assets we've already created and those connections to take it to their own level, to utilize it for their own products. That's absolutely what we're here for.
Uh, it's almost starting to sound like a sales pitch. So I don't know if we want to go down that direction. <laughs> Tommy knows about that, don't you, Tommy? <laughs> yes, sir. I always, it, it, somehow it always gets back to sales. At some point, it's always, I'm always pitching something. Well, you are the face of uh, this whole program right now. And, um, you know, we look, we look to you as, for leadership here and guidance, of course. Well, I got some great support. And I can't wait till Rachel gets on island and we're, we're going to dig deeper into all this fun stuff. Well, there, there's so much, excuse me. Uh, well, there's so much that can be done, and um, you know the key word I've heard um, uh, so far was engagement. And the more you engage with people, the more you you develop a relationship, and that's what life is about. Life is about relationships and experiences. Thank you. And building on that, Mr. Goya. Um, Having your involvement with the DMAP initiative is critical to our success, I think, and ensuring our communities are well represented in the discussions and around tourism and tourism management. I'm island raised from Waimea. My father was a construction grader operator for Morrison Knudsen and Goodfellas. He was active in the development of the tourism infrastructure that built our roadways on the Kohala Coast Mamalahoa Highway from Kauai to Keaho. Just to give you some background, including Mauna Kea, Mauna Lani, Waikoloa Resort, Hualalai, and Allison Onazuka Airport. He was an entrepreneur and a businessman also, and a rancher and a fisherman. And he constructed, um, he contracted to run his D9 on Mauna Kea to clear the snow during the winter season. I share this because I'm influenced by him and grounded by the values of good work developing communities through business opportunities, education, and lifelong learning. I come from the hotel, hospitality, and academic um, background. Prior to this position, I worked for the University of Hawaii School of Travel and Industry Management, developing custom training and executive, executive level programs and curriculums for the travel and tourism industry. And what did they want from us? They wanted everything. They wanted to know how we manage our destination, what, what is our marketing plan? Um, and they wanted to know what the academics was thinking about travel and tourism. Um, and they came from all over Pacific Asia, Japan, Philippines, Korea, and Thailand, just to name a, a few places. But Hawaii was seen as a tourism model everybody wanted to learn about. Uh, we also export, exported our expertise to international destinations like Okinawa, Taiwan, Malaysia, and, and Abu Dhabi. Besides us being a beautiful destination and a very special place, we have something really special here that is built around our communities, something that connects us to this very special place, something that is very difficult to duplicate, and that is the spirit of aloha and ho'okipa. It is in our communities, Aloha and Ho'okipa is nurtured and cared for first and extended into the tourism industry. It is through the people. And I agree with Mar Marcia with that. It is really important our communities are thriving. The purpose of DMAP is to ensure our communities and families thrive around the business of tourism. Our visitors learn they are guests on the island with Kuleana, Tokuko, if they step outside of their hotel, and they're in our communities, they have to take part of that kuleana and stewardship of our aina and natural resources and malama our communities during their visit so that they may engage with our local communities to genuinely have meaningful travel experiences. Uh, we, we want them to have it like we would want our own families and friends to have. So as a native Hawaiian observing tourism industry and its product life cycle from mass tourism to leisure destination, I can say that so many have flocked to our islands to learn about the Hawaiian culture, adopting it as their very own. If they cannot live in Hawaii, they can experience it through their visits and return visits and vicariously through us and all of you. So how much more enriching are their experiences going to be if Hawaii embraces all that we are through our host culture, through its language, its knowledge and agriculture, the flora and fauna and fishing and wayfinding, 
in building and caring for the Loi'i or fish ponds and the arts and crafts and hula. It is uh, nurturing aloha and ho'okipa in our communities and encouraging and sharing our cultures um, and values with our visitors that I believe in a nutshell is what DMAP is about. And as I grow into more into this position, I'm gonna learn more about what it can become. And um, I'm just humbled and grateful to be in the position and to work with all of you in our community to ensure our future generations will benefit from the inspiration that comes from these initiatives. Thank Rachel, you. Rachel, that was absolutely excellent. They Thank should you. make a they, they should make a video, a video of what you just said. Yeah, this is Marcia. I agree. Very well said and welcome home. Thank yeah. you, Marcia. Well done. Uh, I had some uh, Miles, you mentors. recorded this, right? <laughs> <laughs> I we can some, redistribute it. <laughs> I have some wonderful mentors, Chuck G, you know, uh, Dr. Juanita Diu, and, and these were some of the best thinkers in travel and tourism when it came to sustainable tourism. And um, I got to sit around tables of executives from all over different nations and countries. And I learned a lot in my years at the university, but it was coming home. And when this job became available, it was created. And I thought, wow, what a great opportunity to be in a new position that is going to develop and it's going to work with the community and going to work with the uh, leaders to move us forward to um, make sure our communities can thrive in this travel and tourism industry. I'm grateful. Thank you so much. Rachel, thank you, thank you very much for your thoughts. I, I really appreciate that. And uh... I just wanted to add something. Uh, you know, my experience has been there's a lot of local people that don't know our culture. They, they don't know our values uh, here in Hawaii. So maybe some of what we try to teach our visitors, we need to teach our local people and um, have them appreciate what we have here that we can offer to other people. Uh, it, it's kind of scary sometimes how how little a lot of people know. So thank you. Yeah, and, and I love education and learning and training. And I love the university and what the university has done and what our um, Malama programs are doing. So I think that part is going to be a big part of GMAP. And, but, you know, we, we are struggling in our, our state when it comes to... Um, you know, having the best life we can live on our islands. And a lot of people have to travel for long distance to get to their jobs and you know how difficult it can be. So that's always put behind in, in our back of our heads. But in reality, the people who live in our communities are some of the best people in the world. And I can tell you that from my own experience. And they're, they just, you know, they need a break too, right? We all need to work to thrive and to make sure our families are well taken care of. Um, and, and, you know, many of them work in the hospitality and hotel industry. So, so that has to balance with all that we have going on, on our, in our islands and in our states. And it's through the economic development and business opportunities, there's gonna be balance for all of us. Yeah, Alan, I think we're moving in a direction to get back to where we started from. You know, it's the hospitality of Hawaii really came from what we did for us or what the local residents did or what individuals who come from the culture did themselves became opportunities for visitors or that connection to that. And I think we need to do things better for ourselves and then it becomes better for the rest. And, and that uh, invitation then expands outward uh, once we have it done very well internally. And I think that is really where we're trying to go. I think we got to get back to where we started from in order to really uh, have a, a better experience for both our residents and our visitors altogether. Yeah, I agree with you, Russ. I, you know, in the past, uh, tourism was an extension of your family and uh, because they were true visitors to the country. But somewhere along the line, we institutionalized the whole thing. 
<laughs> and it became another animal. So uh, uh, yeah, we, I, we started using words like visitors and tourists instead of guests. <laughs> and, you know, it's we have to look at people as our guests, no matter where they are, where they come from. And, and that really is, is the root of it and, and why the Hawaiian culture and the process or even just local culture as well. All the different ethnicities that do come together that make Hawaii up is, is truly what is intriguing and amazing to someone who has the experience to come in and, and, and be able to participate in it as well. So. Thank you. Wow. Um, you know, uh, thank you, Rachel. Good choice, Mr. Birch. <laughs> well, at least I did one thing, right? At least I can hire. <laughs> um, are there any, does anyone have any other questions for Ross or Rachel? Well, as we go through this process, we'll be reaching out with updates. Uh, both from HTA will provide regular updates if we can have, you know, Miles and Kapua and the rest of the group uh, disseminate that through the chambers as well. Uh, when we start getting into the process future down the line when HTA needs support, um, I'm definitely going to be a lot more vocal than I have been in the past, I think, because we need to be and I need to be a little bit more aggressive in those asks for support. Uh, and, and really help you guys uh, have it outlined with details, like much like Marsha was talking about. I can help provide those details that will help you in, as individuals support HTA's efforts. And as they move forward with any of the newer challenges that are coming on, uh, the community really needs to help us out on that side. Um, I mean, that's so true, Ross. Um, having the information available and or, you know, providing it in the right format for our members to submit testimony and for the, our organizations to submit, you know, it, it's really, really helpful, uh, especially during the ledge process. So uh, having that information, you know, will help us out. Okay, um, we're at the 11 o'clock hour. I always like ending meetings with a smile and happy thoughts and, and good goals in mind. So thank you all for participating. Rachel, thank you thank for you, sharing what you did and um, sharing your thoughts. And uh, Ross, uh, yeah, we'll definitely be in touch. Okay, so aloha everybody. If we don't see you, have a Merry Christmas, happy holidays and uh, keep taking care of yourself. Mahalo, thank you everyone. Thanks everybody. Aloha.